Good morning. Welcome back to the Outreach of the Heart Ministries. I come to you live from Northeast Kansas. I was really anticipating being outside this morning to give this message with the, the lake in the in the background. And, but uh, eh, the wind's blowing just a little bit too much. It would have distorted distorted the, the sound of this message. And so I'm confined to the sleeper once again this morning. But that's all right. Maybe this is where I'm meant to be this morning for this particular message. We're going to be talking today about this word forgiven. Forgiven. Now that's a big topic. A lot of people are not comfortable with this topic. And I believe that that's why the Lord has laid it upon my heart this week to discuss this topic of forgiven. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. What a special day this is to talk about, to talk about you and how you have offered your forgiveness to us. You have offered that forgiveness through your sacrifice on the crucifixion cross. Lord, you shed your blood as an atoning sacrifice so that we may be forgiven in the eyes of God our Father. Lord, we've got to accept that forgiveness. It just doesn't come. It's offered. It's available to everyone. But we're not forgiven unless we act upon your gift, Lord. Your gift of grace. So Lord, as we go through this message this day, help us to understand the importance of being forgiven. And the impact that that has on our lives in our relationships with others and how we look upon ourselves as a forgiven individual. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for this time together with you. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Forgiven. I'm going to ask you just point blank right up front. Are you forgiven? Yes or no? If you know that you are forgiven, give out a little hallelujah. Hallelujah! I'm forgiven. How do I know that I'm forgiven? Because of what God's word tells me. If I don't know what God's word says about being forgiven, then I'm not so sure that I am forgiven, right? Maybe the only verse I know of Scripture, of God's Word, is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so that anyone who shall believe in Him will not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. That's forgiveness, right? How do we obtain everlasting life? It's through the forgiveness of our sins. Okay, if I only know John 3.16... I can become deceived in, in believing that, well, I believe, therefore I am forgiven. And that's what we just take for granted. But then when other scripture comes to light in our life and we begin to question, am I truly forgiven? Is it more than just believing? For anyone who shall believe will not perish but have everlasting life. Belief. What do you believe in? Who do you believe in? Do you believe that God is real? That God created the heavens and the earth? That God rested on the seventh day after creation? What day was mankind created? On day six, mankind was created. 
Do you believe that Jesus lived? On this earth, do you believe that Jesus is fully human yet fully God? He's no longer human, he's no longer in human form, he ascended into heaven. But he walked on this earth. Do you believe this? Sure, you do. Sure, you do. There's no question about that. Even atheists struggle with this and choose to not believe, right? So, what's the confusion about forgiven? Why are you questioning that right now? Is it God, is God allowing you or encouraging you? I shouldn't say that word allow. You have to allow it to happen in your life. God, is God encouraging you to evaluate yourself right now? To evaluate your true forgiveness? How did it come about? What is preventing it possibly? Well, let's turn to Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. For if you forgive other people, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Okay, now you're just a little bit uncomfortable. Why were you questioning your, your forgiveness? Why? Because God was revealing to you that you potentially, now not all of you have this, but many have unforgiveness in their heart towards someone else. And God was revealing that to you within the first few moments of this message. And then he reinforced it with his scripture. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, but in verse 15, if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. If your sins are not forgiven, will you enter into the kingdom of heaven? Absolutely not. Why does Jesus say that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me? Why does Jesus also say that narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it? Through this message today, I'm going to try and encourage you to walk down that narrow road with Jesus. Because if you are living a life of unforgiveness, you are out there on that road that leads to destruction, that road that leads to hell, and you will be separated from God for an eternity. Yeah, but Stace, I, I'm saved. I'm I'm forgiven. I'm. Are you? You may think that you are. Well, I've gone through all the right motions. I said this prayer when I was X number of years old. I was baptized by immersion. I'm saved. I'm this. I'm that. I'm another thing. When God reveals to you something that is separating you from him and you do not act upon it, where does that leave you? Where do you stand in your relationship with God Almighty? So today, as Scripture reveals to us about forgiveness, if we don't forgive others, God himself will not, cannot forgive us. Why? Because we are not taking on the attributes of 
him. How do we take on the attributes of God? We're told that as Christians, we are to be Christ-like. What is Christ-likeness? Loving others as ourselves. Loving God more than anything. But so many of us have a love relationship, not with God, but with our unforgiveness. And I can testify to that. I experienced that for over 30 years in my own life. And that unforgiveness motivated me. It was driving me. It encapsulated me. Every morning when I woke up, the first thing on my mind was my unforgiveness of someone. It broke relationships. It demolished friendships. It isolated me out on this island of, of loneliness. But I held on to it nonetheless. Because I felt that I was given strength for this. It was an excuse for me to act out in different ways. But I knew that I needed to go through this process of forgiveness. Of someone else in my life who had, according to myself, wronged me in many, many ways. Do you have someone in your life that has wronged you? Not just in the big things, but even in the little things, the little disagreements that separate your relationship, that they get between you and your friendship with someone else. And they just kind of, it's kind of like yeast put in the, in the dough and it just rises and it rises and it rises think about how well, many of you have probably never made bread from scratch but you put the yeast in there and you let it sit out on the counter and that yeast just builds and builds and ferments and does its thing and the dough just keeps rising and rising and if if we don't take action upon what the yeast is doing, pretty soon that bread dough will be all over the counter. It'll be flowing onto the floor. It will become wasteful rather than useful. Unforgiveness is like yeast in our life. It just continues to fester. It continues to to grow and grow in an unhealthy manner. And if something isn't done, that unforgiveness begins to flow out of us in things such as hatred, things such as misdeeds, things such as foul language, things such as judgment of others, unrighteous judgment of others. We become burdened by that unforgiveness. Where are you today? Do you have unforgiveness in your heart? Is it separating you from God in any way, shape, or form? Do you feel entrapped by it? Do you feel enslaved to it. Today is the day in which you let that unforgiveness flow out of your heart and never let it return. Okay? Why? Because of the scripture that we opened with. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But 
If you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Let's turn to the book of Psalm. Psalm chapter 32. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the one whose transgressions or sins are forgiven, whose sins are covered. How, how are our sins covered? By the blood of Jesus Christ, the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation of what Christ did for us, the removal of our sins. They're blotted out. They're covered with a white sheet. Because without unforgiveness of sins, God cannot be in a relationship with an unrighteous individual, which is what we are if we are not in Christ Jesus. What does that mean to be in Christ Jesus? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Anyone who is in Christ is a what? A new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We have become born anew in a relationship with Christ Jesus. Our attitude is different. Our heart is different. Our mindset is different. We go from desiring to please ourselves and to please the world to desiring to please God by obeying His commands. That's born anew. And anyone whose sins have been forgiven has been born anew. They are a new creation. Are you a new creation today? Most days I'm not sure. Gosh, hmm, I wonder. Do you harbor unforgiveness? Is it unforgiveness towards someone else that is separating you from Jesus Christ and your relationship with him? Is it unforgiveness of someone else that is driving you to love that unforgiveness more than you love God? God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Well, my friends, you cannot love God if you love unforgiveness you cannot love yourselves if you are harboring unforgiveness towards someone else and you certainly cannot love others if you cannot love God and you cannot love yourself sure you can say you love them you can you can do acts of love but is it authentic? Is it unconditional love? Blessed are the forgiven. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, in whose spirit is no deceit. You see, if you're carrying about unforgiveness towards someone, you are carrying deceit in your heart. You're trying to fool God. Yeah, Lord, I gave my life to you. Yes, I surrendered myself to you. But you're harboring this unforgiveness. You're trying to deceive God. Someone who is blessed has no deceit in them. Do you have deceit in you? Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Well, we, we turn back to the book of Matthew, and we go to the 18th chapter, Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21. This is an example of deceit in our soul. 
deceit in our soul. Matthew chapter 20, or Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. This is subtitled, The Parable of the Unmerciful Servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, I want to clarify something there. My brother or sister. This is not our flesh and blood. This is not our blood relative. When this is referred to as brother and sister, this is in reference to a fellow believer. a fellow follower of Jesus, a fellow disciple. This isn't about those of the world. Who sin against us? Stop and think for just a moment. How often does our government sin against us? How many times do government officials lie to us? That's a sin. How many people rely upon the government rather than reply, re, rely upon the Lord? That's a question that I don't know the answer to, but God knows. God knows. Who do you rely upon? The government or God? Is God bigger than the government? Or is the government bigger than God? Our government here in the United States is trying to tell us that it is bigger than God. Who establishes the government? God does. Who is bigger than government? God is. If you've got that mixed up, you need to do a reality check very quickly and come to terms that God is God over all. Not just some. Okay? Just wanted to clarify that. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. What, what's the significance of 77? This is an infinite number. It means we don't stop forgiving our brothers and sisters. Being a Christian doesn't mean we're perfect. It means we're striving for perfection but we'll never obtain it until we enter into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, but stay. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says we're a new creation. The old, we're no longer sinners. We're saints, right? Is a saint perfect? No. The only perfect human being that ever walked on this earth was God himself. In the form of humanity, Jesus Christ. All others fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's you and me, my friends. We pick up in verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to settle, began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity upon him and canceled the debt and let him go. Verse 28, but when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. 
but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. Verse 35. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Not just in your mind. Oh, I forgive them, you know, no big deal. Yeah, they they did this or that to me. Yeah, no big deal. And you can forgive them in your mind. But God judges your heart. As we look at this parable, what is it telling us? If we fail to forgive someone else the wrong that they have done to us, how is God going to treat us? He's going to treat us the same way we treated that individual or maybe that group of people. Well, I don't go to church anymore because, well, somebody in the church offended me or or hurt my feelings, and I just can't forgive, not just that person, but I can't forgive the church because the church did not take a stand and rebuke that individual who sinned against me. That's the excuse that a lot of people use to not go to church. It drives them from corporate worship. It drives them from a a relationship with other Christians. And if they're not careful, it will drive them from an intimate relationship with Jesus because they harbor that ill feeling towards someone or a group of someones. How is God going to treat us He's going to treat us the same way we treat others. If we do not forgive others, he will not forgive us. Are you an example of that unmerciful servant? You have accepted that God has forgiven you. You live as though you are a Christian. You proclaim the name of Christ. Yet you harbor unforgiveness towards someone else. You're demanding something of them. But yet you've accepted what God has given you. You're unwilling to offer the same to another person that God has offered to you, and that is forgiveness. How will God treat you? This is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. What are we forgiven for by Jesus Christ? What are we forgiven through for through Jesus Christ by God? Sin. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Eternal separation from God. Is unforgiveness a sin? Absolutely. Do you choose to live in that unforgiveness? Do you choose to live in that sin? Absolutely. For the wages of sin is eternal separation from God in a place called hell. Do you harbor unforgiveness? Yet proclaim Jesus as your Lord. Are you forgiven? We turn to the book of Colossians.
Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Let me read this again. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, this, this is the children of God, right? Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Verse 20, so then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat, for when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat in and, and eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Okay, we're talking about sharing and communion. As a body of believers. For your meetings do more harm than good. Now, I've served several different congregations. I've been involved in several different um, movements for the gospel of Christ. And one of the things that ends up happening is the sharing of the elements. The bread and the wine or grape juice. In remembrance of what Christ went through on our behalf. Now if we know the story of the Last Supper, Jesus took bread and blessed it and and went through this activity. Then he took the cup and he blessed it. With the bread, he said that he is the bread of life. With the cup, he referred to that as the blood of the covenant. The blood that would serve as the atoning sacrifice, the final sacrifice. We don't sacrifice blood anymore. We sacrifice things in our own life. But the final blood sacrifice was the blood that shed, Jesus shed on that crucifixion cross for you and for me, for the forgiveness of our sins. If we would accept we will be forgiven. We share in communion as a body of believers. We go through this ritualistic act where we break the bread and we pass it around to others. Or maybe you're in a larger congregation where it's a, it's a little wafer that's passed in a cup or on a plate. And as the plate goes by, you take the little wafer, right? Rather than coming forward and taking a piece of bread. And then this little cup of juice or wine is 
is passed around and as it goes by you 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 take that and then you share in communion whether you do it as a congregation or as it goes by you you partake on your own the different denominations do it differently but how often do people take participation in a rendition or in a remembrance of what the Lord has done for us with unforgiveness in their heart. Harboring anger towards someone else. Having hatred. Hatred is what the yeast of unforgiveness becomes. Hatred. How do I know this? Because I was there, my friends. 30 years of hatred continued to just boil in me until the day that I offered forgiveness. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. We continue on. In verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Verse 27. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have done what? Fallen asleep. But, in verse 31, if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. What is this telling us? What is this telling us? That those churches who, who feel it's it's necessary for everyone to participate in communion Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and they never explain that if you do this with unforgiveness in your heart, you are sinning against God. You are not doing this in remembrance of what Jesus did on that crucifixion cross. You are not doing this in remembrance of the grace God has given you through Jesus Christ or has offered to you through Jesus Christ. They don't explain these things. And then they wonder, well, why is God not blessing me? Why is God not blessing my church? Why, why this? Why this? Why this? Well, today you're learning why. If you have ever participated in the elements of communion, the body and the blood replication of Jesus, the reminder of that, and you have participated expecting God's forgiveness or accepting God's forgiveness, proclaiming God's forgiveness of the sins in your life, yet you're harboring unforgiveness for someone else. What did Jesus say? Forgive others or I will not forgive you. In a form 
you are blaspheming against God's holiness, against his grace. Do you not think that that is going to bring God's wrath upon you, upon that church, that body of believers? Lord, have mercy on on the leaders of that congregation for not revealing this to them. We go back to Matthew chapter 6. Now in a lot of church settings, congregational settings, the Lord's Prayer is spoken by the congregation. I have a problem with this also because people don't understand that when they say the Lord's Prayer and their heart is not in it, they are bringing condemnation upon themselves. They are bringing God's wrath and anger upon themselves and upon the church. Lord, have mercy upon the leaders who influence this. What does the Lord's Prayer say? Or the so-called Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, our sins, as we also forgive those who sin against us. That the Lord's Prayer has that in there? Lord, I thought I was asking you for forgiveness, but here I'm proclaiming that I also am forgiving those who have sinned against me. Oh my goodness, I didn't realize that. Maybe you did realize it. And you just go with the flow. You've said this prayer how many times in a congregational setting with unforgiveness in your heart? unwillingness to forgive. Not just unforgiveness, but unwillingness to forgive someone. Yet you proclaimed in the quote-unquote Lord's Prayer and forgive us our sins, or Lord, forgive my sin as I forgive those who sin against me. And then we go on to verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Oh, what a powerful prayer said by a congregation. As you've heard me talk about the quote-unquote Lord's Prayer before, the opening statement. Our Father, who art in heaven, this prayer should not be spoken by an unbeliever who does not accept God as their father. They are reaping God's anger and wrath upon them in the very first line of this prayer. But you've said it with unforgiveness in your heart. You probably said it when you were a child in the church before you accepted God. Jesus as your Savior? Why does the church struggle so much today? Because it doesn't understand that it itself, as a body of believers, is inviting God's wrath upon it. We need to wake up, my friends. We need to wake up. And it's not just the church, the congregational church. It's you and me as the church. We're not forgiven because we refuse to forgive. 
But Stace, the Bible tells me I'm forgiven. But the Bible also tells you that you're not forgiven unless you forgive. And my friends, the day that I forgave my dad, after 30 years, I walked out of that building changed like no other change that has happened in my life. And I believe that my salvation became complete at that moment. I questioned my salvation prior to age 30. Yeah, I gave my life to Christ at the age of 16. I surrendered all except my unforgiveness. I gave him everything except that unforgiveness. And the day that I surrendered that unforgiveness and said, Lord, it's no longer mine. I give it to you to do as you please. I was a changed man. I can't express to you the emotional burden that was lifted from me. I can't express to you how I walked out of this building upright for the first time in my life of 30 plus, of 30 years. Because the burden that had, had festered, the, the yeast of unforgiveness had grown into hatred. And it just poured out of me. Oh, I tried to hide it. Oh, I tried to hide it, but I couldn't hide it from God. What is unforgiveness doing in your life? Is it destroying your life? And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Second Chronicles, chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. That's great. Isn't that wonderful? What Solomon had done pleased the Lord. But then the Lord goes on to say in verse 13, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their what? Their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this place temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, beginning in verse 17, if you walk before me faithfully as David your father did and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father when I said you shall never fail to have a susceptible successor to rule over Israel. But, but, in verse 19, if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. This temple will become a heap of rubble. 
All who pass by will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? And people will answer, Because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why he brought all this disaster upon them. Did that disaster occur to Solomon's temple? Yes, it did. Solomon's temple lay in a heap of rubble to this day. Why do we expect the church to thrive and to survive in a body with a body of believers that looks no different than the world? Thriving with a body of believers that doesn't know, doesn't care, doesn't understand, doesn't want to understand that there's more to forgiveness than what they've ever been told, than what they've ever understood. And today, as you listen to this message, you have no excuse any longer. You go to a worship service. And worship with a congregation, a group of fellow believers and unbelievers. And you participate in communion. You say the Lord's Prayer as a congregation. And you have unforgiveness in your heart. Unforgiveness in your soul. And yet you do these abominable things, these disgraceful things in the eyes of God, and you expect blessings to be upon you and upon your church, your body of believers? Why? How? Do you not understand that you are bringing God's wrath upon yourself? Your church, the body of believers, if you participate in such things. So why do we forgive? I've just got some statements here that I felt the Lord impressed upon me. Why do we forgive? Well, we'll look at the whys after we look at some other examples. The why we don't examples. Or the misunderstanding of forgiving someone. Anyway, just listen to these statements. We don't forgive just to escape God's wrath. That's not the, the reason for forgiveness. We don't forgive someone just to escape God's wrath. Why would we do such a thing? Because God says, if you don't forgive, I will not forgive you. And I will heap my wrath upon you, which is sending you to hell for an eternity. <clears throat> Are you willing to die with unforgiveness in your heart? Don't forgive just because you're afraid of God's wrath. Forgive because you desire something more, which we'll discuss in a moment. We don't forgive someone in expectation of them changing. That's also a misconception. Well, if I forgive this person, well, God will work in their life and they'll be different. Why does Scripture say that we're to forgive our brother and our sister not just seven times, but 77 times, an infinite number of times? Because our forgiveness doesn't change them. It changes us and our relationship with the Lord, our God. 
It changes us, not them. We don't forgive to draw attention to ourselves so that we can go up before the congregation and say, Oh, Lord have mercy, I forgave so-and-so. They're sitting right there. Oh, I have forgiven them. Life is wonderful. I've seen that happen in a body of believers. It was all for show. It wasn't for real. We don't forgive to make life easier for ourselves. I want to go back to that day. That day that I forgave my dad. After 30 years of letting that yeast of unforgiveness fester in me and swell and overflow into my every being, resulting in hatred towards a man. Did life, the moment I forgave my dad, did it become easier? Just a few months later, my wife, the mother of our children, decided to move out. I went to work one morning. I came home to an empty house. My wife was gone. My two children were gone. My life was uprooted, completely uprooted. Had this happened before this process of, of forgiveness to my dad? Who knows what I would have done? But instead, I walked around the house and I forgave my wife for her actions. And they were authentic. They were real. But life, because I forgave one person, it didn't become easier. It has been a life now of forgiving others as they have done wrong to me. It's become a way of life. Not just an action that I, oh my, I have to do this because if I don't, the Lord won't forgive me and I'm going to experience His wrath and punishment. So I'm going to recap those. We don't forgive to escape God's wrath. We don't forgive someone expecting them to change. We don't forgive to draw attention to ourselves. And we don't forget to make life easier for ourselves. Now, why do we forgive them? We forgive because we understand God's forgiveness of us. We forgive because we understand God's forgiveness of us. We, for we forgive because we desire to be set free from the bondage of unforgiveness. We forgive because we are obedient to God's suggestions? No. Obedient to God's commands. It is a commandment to forgive. It's not a suggestion. It is a commandment. And if we choose to live in unforgiveness, we are disobeying a commandment of the Lord our God. And yet we still want and expect his blessing in our life? When we choose to live a life in an area of sin? But yet you look down at the person who, who an unmarried couple living together. They have a child together. Yet we, we look down at that person. And we say, oh my, that person, those, those two individuals, they're bringing up a child in a life of sin. They need to get married. I'm dealing with that in my own life. My son and my to-be daughter-in-law have a child and they're unmarried. And I don't know if they're going to get married or not. 
They talk that they will. But there's also government programs out there that they get money from to help them make it through these tough times if they remain unmarried. Which is greater, the government or God? My encouragement to them is trust more in God than relying upon the government and their financial gifts. But how can I look down upon them if I have unforgiveness in my heart? Am I not also choosing to live in sin and separating myself from a true relationship with Jesus? We forgive because it is a form of what? Repentance. Have you ever heard it expressed that way? We forgive because it is a form of repentance. What is repentance? Turning away from where we once were headed. Turning away from sin. How do we turn away from forgiveness or for, from unforgiveness? How do we repent from unforgiveness? We forgive. Not to escape God's wrath. Not expecting that other person to change. Not to draw attention to ourselves. And not to make life easier. But because we're followers of Christ, we desire to be in a, an intimate marriage relationship with the Lord, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And unforgiveness is a barrier between us. I want to talk just briefly. Well, maybe not. It's already been an hour. Maybe next week we'll come back with this question, forgive and forget. We'll close out of Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Verse 37. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Heavenly Father, I ask for your forgiveness. Lord, if there's someone in my life that I... I harbor ill feelings towards that I have not yet forgiven. Lord, I don't want to go through this earthly life in this temporary home, which we call earth. I long for your heaven, Lord. I desire to be with you for an eternity. But if, Lord, there is unforgiveness somewhere in my heart, in my soul, in my mind, that I harbor towards someone else. Reveal that to me this day, Lord. And help me to repent of that unforgiveness. And to offer that person forgiveness. It doesn't have to be done in person. It's not, Lord, that you require us to go to someone and say, hey, I forgive you. We do that in our own privacy. Because when we go to someone else and say, oh, I forgive you, and we embrace them, Lord, we're expecting that person to receive that and be changed by it. But when we do it in private, in the presence of only you, Lord, our motive is clear and precise. It is an act of repentance. It is a throwing out of the yeast of unforgiveness. 
and the hatred that it produces. And it will change our life forever. Because it sets us free. And removes the barrier between you and ourselves, Lord. So those this day who harbor unforgiveness, let them understand the consequences that are upon them for harboring for living in that unforgiveness. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.